Many skeptics try to account for the Gospels with the claims that they are the product of a long chain of oral tradition where stories were transmitted from one person to another and in the process were changed beyond recognition. Uh, even some people invented new stories from nothing and uh, these were then collected together by the gospel writers and written down decades later to produce something that's very unlike what really happened during the time of Jesus's teaching. Now, that theory isn't supported by evidence. Uh, it comes from what sceptical critics imagine must have happened. They say it must have happened like this. That's about as far as it goes. And in this video, I'm going to look at some real evidence and show how it undermines the oral tradition model that the, the sceptical critics present. Now, let's look at the oral tradition model. So it starts off with Jesus, who uh, travels around in Galilee, maybe in Judea. He uh, goes to Jerusalem a couple of times where he's crucified. And people then start a community based on this Jesus. They they uh, they form churches, they form congregations. It spreads. As it spreads, people want to hear stories about Jesus. And so uh, a new congregation is founded. They want to have stories about Jesus. What they do is they go to uh, an earlier congregation down the road, might be an hour or two's walk away they get someone he comes he tells them stories about jesus and then those get passed on a year or so later to another congregation and so on and that goes on for decades with transmission after transmission after retelling after retelling each time a little bit of a change might happen to the story the the stories are lined up with the needs of the local congregations maybe new stories are invented maybe some stories disappear and you get this idea of a sort of cloud of oral tra tradition uh, which is going on and which is gradually changing to fit the church's needs. And then, uh, starting with Mark in about 70 to 80 AD, Matthew and Luke, 80 to 90, John, uh, 90 to 100 AD, these traditions get written down and they form the Gospels that we have. This is the sort of form critical model, but it's an all transmission model. We'll come back to form criticism later. So the idea of the tradition is written down quite late on, having been passed on orally before that. And this method of transmission is an inaccurate method of transmission. That's the, the first thing, so that um, people don't really know what Jesus said. One or two things might be genuine, but a lot of it is invented or changed by the church as it passes it on. Uh, some traditions are even invented from scratch so that they're nothing whatsoever to do with Jesus. Uh, and as I said, they're modified to meet the needs of the church. Uh, the, there's a lot of effort goes into working out how the particular stories would meet the needs of the church. Uh, and they talk about the Zitz im Leben the German phrase means situation in life. They're talking about um, how a particular set of circumstances in the church might call for a particular story to uh, to be um, retold uh, and how that might modify the story. Okay, we'll come back to that later. So there are certain assumptions behind this uh, way of looking at uh, the Gospels. Um, first of all, it wasn't based on looking at ancient literature. It was based on an analysis of the transmission of folk stories in rural Germany. What they did was they looked at the folk stories and the, the, the critics discovered that when a story was made up, it usually had a particular form. It's in England, you get fairy stories that start off once upon a time and end and they all lived happily ever after. And this sort of idea of, of a traditional form was there in German folk stories. Um, the idea then is that if the tradition gets a long way away from this traditional format, then it's been changed a lot by being transmitted from one person to another. That's the, the basic picture of form criticism. 
by and large, people don't believe that anymore after all. The Gospels are not 19th century German folk stories. They were written in the first century AD and they follow first century rules. It presumes that there were a lot of generations between Jesus and the Gospels being written down, not generations in time, but people passing on from one person to another. The Gospels were passed on very many times, um, so they could be changed. And uh, it presumes that the people who passed on the tradition and they uh, didn't take much care in, in getting them accurately described and that the gospel writers at the end didn't try to check them and find out whether they were accurate or not so there's no attempt in quality control what you've got is a set of developing traditions rather than accounts of jesus that would mean that the church had no interest in reporting uh, what jesus said or did accurately uh, they're not trying to ensure the accuracy of the stories because they're not interested in doing so if the church was interested in, in Jesus, in, in knowing what Jesus did, then they would have taken much more care. Uh, and the other thing that goes into it is the idea that, that if the church couldn't think of an episode from Jesus directly, then they would invent one. And these episodes weren't seen as any different from the others, and they also went into the Gospels. And all these are, are causes of inaccuracy in the Gospel teaching. Okay. Let's look at the evidence that goes with that. So the first question is, were there many generations of tran transmission? Was there a long way, a lot of retellings between the Gospels being written down and the, the ministry of Jesus? Well, the traditional picture has nothing written down very much before 70 AD. Some uh, critics would say, yeah, well, the Gospel of Mark written down shortly before 70 AD. That's a possibility, they'd say. We've had a look at this before. We have a video on this channel which talks about the dates of the Gospels and shows how you can fix them. And that those dates are wrong. The real dates are much earlier. Mark coming in somewhere between 50 and 55 AD. Matthew and John both being completed definitely before 70 AD and almost certainly before 66 AD. And Luke coming in before 61 AD, maybe uh, as early as, as 58 AD. Um, so we have a much earlier set of Gospels. That's the first thing. The second thing is to think, so there they are. The second thing is to think, would they fit in the lifetime of the apostles? And we know that when some of the apostles died, we can work it out fairly easily. So Peter and Paul, they die in Rome. And they die at the start of the persecution of Nero. Well, Nero's persecution started after the fire of Rome in 64 AD. It probably got going towards the end of 64. It was certainly going strong in 65 AD. So Peter and Paul died late 64 or early 65 AD, particularly as Paul was at that point in prison, easy to get hold of. Now, we know when they died. We know that up to that time, Peter and Paul are witnesses available to see whether the church is telling what Jesus said. We also know that they died violent deaths. They didn't die naturally. They could have lived on a lot longer. And other people who didn't die those violent deaths would live on a lot longer. James, the brother of Jesus, he lives on through 62 AD when he is stoned to death uh, in Jerusalem. Again, a violent death. He could have lived considerably longer than that and carried on giving evidence that other people would have done so and of course we've got james the brother of john he dies in probably about 41 a.d uh, in the reign of herod agrippa the uh, first and it's another violent death the other end of the scale we've got long-lived people the apostle john is probably the longest living of the apostles and the the author's of the second century writers like Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp say that he lived on into the reign of the emperor Trajan. So he lives on well past the writing of the gospels and he's able to say whether they were accurate or not. And there'll be lots of other people who lived that long. Not all life tended to end rapidly with a disease or something like that in those days, 
but there would be people who did live as long as the apostle john there would be other disciples there would be uh, people who knew jesus and became christians there would be enemies of jesus people like the pharisees these all live on for quite a long time and they would certainly say so if the gospels didn't report things accurately so we have witness of eyewitnesses whether they wrote the gospels or not some of the gospels were written by eyewitnesses but that's a separate matter um whether the gospels were written by eyewitnesses or not there were people who were eyewitnesses who would read them who would see them who would know whether they were accurate or not um so they're alive when the gospels are written another thing that you you get with the oral models is the idea that the the gospels were never checked against the memory of of witnesses that the gospel writers didn't check to see whether their information was accurate uh in fact they go on to say that well the gospels couldn't have been written by their named writers why not well those named writers were in fact witnesses uh so it's very important that a, 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 a skeptic will get down into your mind the idea that the the gospels were written by unnamed writers again something else to look at at some other time but uh there is a big emphasis in the gospels on uh eyewitness accounts um certainly the new testament is concerned as to whether it is reporting jesus accurately or not um, for example passages in uh, 1 corinthians chapter 7 so in verse 10 paul writes to the married i give this charge not i but the lord the wife should not separate from her husband so uh paul is being very careful to point out that he's reporting here the words of jesus these are words that are also recorded in the gospel of mark which is probably being written a little bit before uh, paul writes corinthians here 1 corinthians uh, if you go on to verse 12 um paul says to the rest i say i not the lord that if any brother has a wife who's an unbeliever and she consents to live with him he should not divorce her so um paul is giving advice and he's prepared to say this is advice that is not recorded as being advice given by jesus he's keen to distinguish between the advice that he is given as an apostle and the advice that he has from jesus there's no idea of mixing it up or making something up to put it in the words of jesus so that the church has guidance that apparently comes from jesus and in fact if we go to verse 25 in the same chapter um we get an, another example of it he says now concerning the betrothed i have no command from the lord so here he's saying look in the gospel record you can listen to the reported sayings of jesus you won't find anything about this subject and he's right it's not there in the gospels the important point though is that paul is very concerned is he uh reporting the words of jesus or is he saying something which isn't the words of jesus he is checking himself to make sure that his information is accurate and comes from jesus and there's a general expectation at the time that a disciple would accurately report what was given him by his teacher here's a a, a passage from the, the talmud it's from the, the mishnah uh, from the, the chapter avot um and it, it's talking about one rabbi yohanan who has various disciples and he gives the the um the best things about those disciples and the first one he talks about is uh eliezer ben hakanas and he calls him a plastered sister a plastered sister which loses not a drop in other words the teaching that's gone into him none of it gets lost it's all kept there and it's passed on to other people and that's the background against which jesus taught he teaching in a background where disciples were expected to report their teachers 
sayings and deeds and, and conclusions accurately. That's the, the kind of witness we have that wrote the Gospels or that produced the Gospels. And again, another claim, the, the Gospels says, never claim to be witness statements. Well, they do. The New Testament is full of comments about witnesses. Here's one from John chapter 19. Uh, John is at the cross. And he's looking at Jesus and she says, beside his pierced out comes clear fluid water, he calls it, and, and blood. And then he says, he who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true and he knows that he's telling the truth that you also may believe. He is saying very clearly that he was there at that time. There's another similar saying. This is a little bit earlier. He's talking to the disciples and of the disciples. He's saying, you will bear witness because you've been with me from the beginning. And that's a, another feature of the witnesses that the, uh, the, the, the Gospels talk about is that they're talking about witnesses that come from the beginning, from the source of what he said. That's, that's what being meant by that phrase, as, as it usually was in, in uh, writings of that time. And uh, the biggest of these passages that says that is, is in 1 John. It's a letter which I think that went round with the gospel. The letter itself doesn't contain any eyewitness statements about Jesus, but the, the gospel does. Uh, just think what this, this, gospel, this uh, letter says. It says, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life and he's, he's talking about very clearly about an eyewitness experience things he'd seen himself he says the life was made manifest and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the father and made manifest to us and again he's saying he saw it himself verse three that which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you so you may have fellowship with us and really, there are three verses there that are very clearly stating that John was a witness in the clearest possible terms, and that what he's done is to pass on what he's seen to you. And that's what's there in the gospel. And there are many other passages that say the same thing. That's not a complete list. That's how much I could fit onto the slide. But nonetheless, it's a, it's a fair number of passages which talk uh, about the disciples as eyewitnesses of jesus whose task was then to go on and tell other people what they had seen or what they had heard another bit of evidence the evidence of language now the the early church spoke greek the gospel readers read greek that's why the gospels are written in greek so the new testament church is doing its business in greek but Jesus lived in a world which was very Semitic. Uh, people spoke Greek. There's a lot of Greek spoken. You even get Greek graffiti on the walls and you get uh, occasionally Greek even inside tombs where people didn't go. It made them unclean. Uh, it shows that the undertakers even wrote little notes themselves in Greek and, of course, also in Aramaic. And th th there's clear evidence in the Gospels that there is an Aramaic background to what's said there. So in, in the Gospels, you get Aramaic fragments. Uh, Jesus on the cross says, Eloi, Eloi, Lama, Sabachthani. He is quoting Psalm 22, but he's quoting it Aramaic, not its original Hebrew. You get plays on Aramaic words. Jesus says, uh, talks about straining out a, a gnat and swallowing a camel. Well, the Aramaic for a camel is gamla, the Aramaic for a gnat is kamla. Uh, it's a play on words. Um, you get idioms. Um, you get occasions where, where Jesus um, says things like, let these words sink down in your ears. He talks about um, people casting out your name as evil. No, no native Greek speaker ever said that. That's said in Aramaic, or it's said by someone whose native thought 
is in Aramaic. And so we've got a connection here with the, the Aramaic of the time of Jesus. And there are lots and lots more technical bits where a Semitic grammatical forms appear, lots of sentences beginning with the word and, for example, which would be very bad form if you were, were speaking Greek or if you were thinking in Greek. Um, now, the mainstream church spoke Greek. If it was inventing traditions or it was changing traditions, then they would be changed into a Greek form, not into an Aramaic form. And these linguistic fossils would very rapidly be lost. The fact that they are there shows that the Gospels have not much been altered, that they're a fairly reliable picture of what Jesus said and what he did. So the oral tradition of the early church wouldn't produce these Aramaic linguistic fossils. It's not the sign of an oral tradition. We've got the sign of, of something written accurately that describes what actually happened. And on the same kind of level, we, we get speech patterns that Jesus has that are, are there in the Gospels, but which are completely unlike anybody else. So, for example, the Gospels contain lots of parables. The epistles don't contain parables. The Old Testament has a very small number of parables, but nothing like the rate that Jesus talks of them at. And we don't have many ancient parables other than the ones in the Gospels. The early church fathers don't write in parables. Paul has a couple of sayings that are a bit like parables, but they're nothing like the, the kind of frequency you get with Jesus. But the Gospels contain lots and lots of parables and a whole lot more parable like saying so it's a characteristic of jesus which is not a characteristic of the early church but something which uh is found throughout the gospels it's something that must come from one man you can't imagine lots of people with oral traditions inventing parables and never doing it anywhere other, other time jesus has unique speech characteristics which don't appear in other literature so for example he says amen at the beginning of a sentence amen i say unto you and then whatever it is that he's saying. Um, you get him uh, making pithy sayings, things like the first will be last and the last will be first, or um, let these uh, let he who has ears to hear, let him hear. You get these, these sayings uh, keep on going on. There will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. But you don't find those sayings or anything like those sayings in the letters or in the early church fathers. They're not found outside the Gospels. What you have is the unique style of Jesus in four different Gospels. Um, but you don't get in the letters, nor in the early church fathers. So if you want to have this oral tradition idea, you've got to have the idea that people all over the Roman Empire, speaking Greek to one another, invent unique speak speech patterns for Jesus, which are the same wherever those are invented. It's easy to believe that one person had those characteristics and is being reported in the Gospels. Now, when we look at, at the Gospels, the, the, the passage that often comes up is this one, the, the start of the Gospel of Luke, and he's talking about why he wrote the Gospel. He starts off by saying, well, there are other accounts around. Lots of people have, have put together a narrative of the things that, that happened. So there are other accounts in circulation, and the authors has heard those. And those accounts, at least in part, would live by eyewitnesses. He's got others called ministers of the word, maybe even be the same per people who have uh, delivered them. So they're, they're not talking about long chains of tradition. We're talking about people who were close to the original. Now, um, Luke wants to make sure that he has the, the, the story correct, and so he's followed all things closely. Now, that's a, a uh, slightly odd translation that the words anothen um, means that he's got it from the original. But it may be from above, or maybe he's got it from the, the original data. He has clearly found out what actually happened. That's what he's saying. And he's uh, done it from the start. So he's followed things closely. A big part of Nanothen is this 
for some time past it's translated there. From the start, he's gone right back to the horse's mouth and he's got the information. And then he is writing down uh, what he's found for Theophilus in uh, an orderly account. He's put it in a systematic way. The other accounts apparently weren't systematic. They would perhaps be told in a different order every time. Luke's account is systematic. It isn't necessarily chronological, but it is put down in a systematic way. And his reason is to show Theophilus the truth of these other stories that are going around. So, yes, there's an oral tradition. The oral tradition, though, comes from people who are eyewitnesses themselves. And uh, Luke has gone back to the start to make sure that he has an accurate picture of what is being said. That's that's what that passage tells us. More evidence still, direct evidence, all sorts of things that are there in the Gospels that would have been lost if there had been generations of oral transmission. So if you're an archaeologist, for example, if you dig up in the, the, uh, the ground, you can find things from the time of Jesus. You can find the general layout of towns. You can find something about the customs of the time. You can find lots of little details. There are big things. You will know that the governor was Pontius Pilate because he left an inscription. We know that the high priest was Caiaphas, who actually got Caiaphas's bones uh, in an ossuary. Um, but the important things here are the details. So uh, if you're passing on in oral tradition, you might keep the gist of a story, but the detail will be the stuff that would tend to be lost. So, for example, well, Luke 5 verse 19 talks about the roof. They let, let a, a paralyzed man down through a roof. And it Luke 5 verse 19 tells us that that roof was tiled. Now, tiling was used in some places, but more often than not in that part of the world, it was done with, with mud brick. You know, put branches over the top and then covered it in mud, and then let it bake in the sun. Nice and waterproof and keeps the heat uh, out in the summer. But it turns out that in Galilee, the roofs were usually tiled. Uh, John 2 verse 6 is, is another one. It says, uh, John 2 verse 6, now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Now, over the whole of the Eastern Mediterranean, water jars are made of um, earthenware. It's cheap, easy to do on a potter's wheel, and uh, it holds the water fine. In fact, it's slightly porous, so the water seeps the outside and evaporates, and it keeps it cool. Um, but it turns out, the archaeologists can show, that in uh, Galilee and in Judea, at the time of Jesus, people preferred the much more expensive uh, stone water jars and lots of those have been dug up but it's just one time and it's just one place and that's where the gospels came from so if that had been made up by a um by a greek speaking person from the the greek world part of the early church they would never have thought of stone water jars they didn't exist outside jewish areas or jewish governed areas of the time Undesigned coincidence, again, you'll find that there are videos about undesigned coincidences on this channel, little link in at the bottom, and um, those depend on tiny insignificant details in the text, the stuff that would be lost almost immediately if a story was being transmitted orally, uh, the stuff that would never be put in if uh, a story was being invented. The fact that undesigned coincidences exist is a guarantee that uh, nothing has been added, that nothing has been changed. Uh, and they're naturally just details. Geographical references. Uh, John writes about there being five uh, uh, porticos on the pool of Bethesda. He writes about the depth of the, the uh, Jacob's well. Uh, Matthew talks about the name of the field where Judas died or was buried both uh, it's called the field of blood. Um, all sorts of little geographical references. Some of those we've, we've confirmed archaeologically, the John ones very definitely. Some of them come up in ancient literature. Um, but again, those are things that would rapidly be forgotten. In 70 AD, the Romans overran the country. The population was deported. Uh, 
buildings were knocked down, everything was changed, and memory would rapidly be lost. But the fact that it's correct in the Gospels means the Gospels have an accurate report of what was there at the time of Jesus. So it's a knowledge of the area before 70 AD. And in fact, there were changes between uh, then and uh, the time of the Romans uh, coming to destroy it all. So uh, one uh, professor of, of ancient history at, at Oxford uh, said he thought that John's Gospel was written before 41 AD because it has such a good description of Jerusalem before that date. Um, doesn't follow it might be that john had a very good memory which is more likely the case but nevertheless it does show that there is an accurate report of what really happened rather than something made up uh, in oral transmission by a community and the last one is a more modern one it's one that's come up lately if you compare uh, the number of times people get called particular names so simeon's the most common one uh, in the the the, the gospels also uh, in real life people have dug up um tombs they've looked in ancient literature and they've produced a catalog of names of people living in various parts of the world from about 300 bc to about 300 a.d and the gospels match palestine at the time of jesus ministry and they don't match egypt and they don't match turkey at the same time and they don't match different times they're exactly right for the time and place. Again, if you're making it up, it will be very, very difficult to get the distribution right, particularly as the ideas of statistical distribution weren't even invented at that point. So the conclusion of the evidence, the oral hypotheses don't work. The Gospels aren't produced by lots of transmissions of oral tradition, changing them all the time and building up uh, new stories they have all the all the, the hallmarks or the evidence gives all the hallmarks of uh, something which is an accurate report of the time there isn't enough time for uh, an oral tradition to develop before the gospels are written down the gospels are written before the apostles died so the apostles will be able to correct them if the uh, if there was a mistake in them the assumptions behind these oral tradition models are unrealistic. They're based on folk stories in uh, 19th century Germany, uh, not on the way that, that people worked in the in first century Judea and Galilee. Um, they presume that there was no interest in getting it right, whereas Christians, of course, had interest in the teachings of Jesus. The fact the Gospels exist shows they had interest in the teachings of Jesus. That's what the Gospels are for. To give a picture of the teachings of jesus and of course they could check the stories of jesus with people who've been alive and been there and seen what actually happened and finally the direct evidence archaeology linguistic fossils the unique wording of jesus on design for instances knowledge of geography of the time they all show that the gospels have a reliable picture and so what we can say is that the oral tradition models fail to match the evidence, but the idea that the Gospels are an accurate record put by people who knew what they were talking about fits the evidence exactly. So if you like the video, there's a, a, a button that you can use to show you liked it. Please subscribe to the channel. That way you'll be able to find more videos on the same kind of thing. And may God be with you and bless you.